I guess my screen should be there, right? Yes. So we discussed in this table J3.2 about different fasteners. And then we said that you can have this uh, the conventional or regular bolts. This is what you call here machine bolts, the A307, if I may zoom in here. And then we said we have this high threads bolts on three grades. The first one is group A and then group B and then group C. Group A is going to be those like the A325, right? And for group B is going to be like the 490, a little bit stronger. Group C is going to be the 3043 bolts. Most likely we'd like to stay with 325 as much as we can in the project. And in certain cases, we may have to switch to A490. If you know nothing about the, the threaded part or the, the fastener, you can use this information provided at the bottom, which is this guy here. So for each one of them, for each one of these groups, you're gonna have the tensile strength as in KSI, and here's a number, like for example, for A307, it's gonna be 45 KSI. Once you hit here, group A is gonna be 90, like the 325. And if you notice here for both of these two options, this gave you the N case and the X case. N means thread is, the thread is included and X thread is excluded. And as you see here, intention doesn't matter because the threaded section is gonna be there anyways. It's gonna be included in the analysis. And the good thing is this group here, you can apply it to any of these groups if you like, for example. Uh, this here says that you take 75% of F sub U. So if you really like to, to know F sub U for this group of bolts, just take this number here divided by 0.75. Does this make sense? So therefore, 0.75 of F sub U for this group C, for example, is going to be 150. So if you go back to the table that has the STM and the parameters for it, F sub U and F sub Y, of course, for bolts, you don't have F sub Y, but generally speaking, uh, the table includes F sub Y and F sub U. If you go there and then look for, let's say, group A for the 325, you're going to see here that the ultimate strength is going to be equal to 90 divided by 0.75. It's going to be over 100. Uh, same thing for the shear, the 0.45 and 0.563 F sub U. We said that we have in this table 7.1, we have the available shear is given directly to us. And this is actually, is gonna be one table. You start here at five eighths of an inch, and then you continue to one inch and then one and one eighth to one and a half. As if this piece of the table, you can just put it side by side to this section of the table. Um, group A, like the 325. So I added the 325. As you see here, I added in red, the 490, the 3043, and then the 8307. So for each one of them, you have this Gabby for LRFD. If you like to do LRFD design or SD design, you have the values. And this Gabby VRN. The stress itself is Gabby used for LRFD design. It's Gabby, let's say for the end case, it's Gabby 40.5, and here's Gabby 51. And then you have the case of single shear and double shear. To understand difference between single shear and double shear, you have this diagram right next to it. Now let's move forward. We're gonna be looking here at the available tensile strength. As you see here, there is no N and X case because the thread is gonna be included in the tension anyways. And the same thing for each bolt, you're gonna have for ASD and LRD, the tensile strength of each one of this bolt based on the side. Uh, if you like to confirm, if I may go here back a few slides, just to confirm the equation that we used, the fee factor is 0.75 and you are going to be using a lot of D. And the fee factor is listed right here at the bottom of the table. It says here, fee factor of 0.75. But just in case, if at any time you'd like to use ASD, you need to understand it's going to be equal to Fn divided by omega, and omega is going to be equal to 2.0. This is going to be your safety factor. Any questions? Okay, I'm just trying to um, review quick what we have covered last time. All dimensions, we're gonna stay here with the standard of all dimension. The standard size for the hole is gonna be based on the ball diameter. As you see here, the difference is gonna be only one sixteenth of an inch larger. 
meaning from each side of the bolt, you're gonna have one thirty second gap between the bolt and between the hole. With that, you're able to transfer the force directly by bearing. As you know that we have slip critical and then we have direct bearing. Generally speaking, direct bearing is gonna give you higher values than slip critical, which is based on the friction. At the bottom here, if you look here, if the bolt is more than one and one eighth of an inch, just add one sixth of an inch, which is the rule for all the standard size bolts. About edge distance, we discussed this issue about the direction for the shear. And then we say, anyways, I'm gonna be using this, uh, the shear edges in all my analysis. I don't wanna use this. Just to be sure that maybe sometimes you look at the drawing or the detail and you're not sure about direction of shear. So let's just stay with the shear edges. So let's say that you have an inch, usually you'd like to keep it as one and three quarter of an inch. This gives you the number that you'd like to use for all of this size, which means um, okay. Meaning that uh, for all of this bolt size, I'm gonna be using one and three quarter of an inch. So this is gonna be the number that can be using for all of this bolt size. So one and three quarter is gonna be the size or the edge distance I'm gonna be using. Let's say start from three quarter of an inch all the way to an inch, just to be in the safe side. First example, it says connection provided in this figure, figure five two, shows an angle and a plate, A36. So here's the steel angle and here's the plate. There's only one plate and only one steel angle. So in a case like this, I'm gonna have only a single shear on both of these two bolts. It's not gonna be double shear. It's one plate and one angle. Let me go back to this quick sketches. This is when you have single shear, double shear. So in my case, I'm gonna have one angle, one plate. I don't have two angles or two plates to consider to be double shear. The bolts conforms to ASTM A307. This gave you like the conventional bolt, the machine bolts, normal trends. The connection capacity is nearly equal to. Then I have here four options. Now connection capacity is gonna be based on three items. You have here three items in the picture. This angle would see tension and this plate is gonna see tension and the bolts can see shear, single shear. So the connection capacity is gonna be the lowest of all the three items. Tension in the angle, tension in the plate, and shear in the bolts. So I'm looking here for the size, it says here, two, three quarter of an inch, okay? Two, three quarter of an inch, I have two bolts, three quarter of an inch, A307. Looking here at my table, the table seven one, a307 is gave you shear and gave you here single shear. So this gave you like this single shear, right? I'm gonna go here to three quarter of an inch and here's the strength. Roughly nine kips per bolt. I have two bolts, so it's gonna be two times 8.97. It's gonna be 17.9. And I have it right here, about 18 kips. So nine times two is about 18 kips. You see this number here? This gave you for the bolts. If you are in for both bolts, it's gonna be two times the strength of one bolt. I still have the angle and I still have the plate. So angle and the plate, we have done this in the past. We have done the tensile strength. So I'm gonna say Ftn for the angle, I have two equations. One is gonna be for the yield failure and the other is gonna be for the rupture, which means ultimate failure. You take here 90% of F sub y, times A gross of the bolt. What'd you get here, the gross area of the bolt? You take it from here, look at this. Three quarter of an inch, right? Three quarter of an inch. Am I correct? No. I'm looking here for the angle, cross section area of the angle. You take it from the table of properties for the angles. It's gonna be 194 square inches. So it is not really in here. What's gonna be in here? or what do I need from the bolt information is gonna be this hole size. So three quarter of an inch, hole size the standard is gonna be 13 16 of an inch. 
And this is what you see here. The bold diameter is gonna be 0.1825. This gives you the whole size times the thickness of the angle, quarter of an inch, and this will account for the whole size. So two equations again. The first one's about yielding, the second one's gonna be about rupture. The first one yielding, you have a fee factor of 0.9 and then use A cross. And here we go. Second equation you need to use here A net. And for A net, what you need to do is to find out the whole size, right? Multiply by the angle thickness. Why the angle thickness? Because the angle says here, four by four by quarter of an inch. So the angle leg thickness is quarter of an inch. And here is the information I have, 75 and fraction. Now, which one controls within the, I'm gonna see here within what? Within the angle only is gonna be 62. I don't really need to look at this number. How about the plate? I'm gonna say the plate is gonna be the same. Same thing, 836. So it's gonna be phi of 0.9, FY 36. The plate size is how much? I'm gonna say here the plate size is six inches for the width by, say is the plate thickness. How much is the plate thickness? Do we have any information about the plate? Oh, it says here plate half an inch. So the plate cross sectional area across is going to be half inch by six. It's going to be three square inches, six inch by half inch. For the net, I need to subtract six, subtracting the whole damper, not the whole damper. And again, times 0.5. So actually, this number, the yield, this is going to be controlling my design. Now compare the 18 caps, 62 versus 97. So the smallest of all of them is going to be this 18 caps, which is kind of like the weakest link, if you like. So what happens in a problem like this, I have three items. I have an angle, a plate, and then I have two bolts. I check the threads of this angle in tension and the plate in tension and the bolts in shear. And the smallest of all of them was the strength of these two bolts. So now you control the capacity of this connection to only 18 caps, which is your answer B. Any questions? So I guess a connection problem like this is gonna cover the tensile, strength capacity for steel sections and also the bolt strength in direct shear. We call this direct shear. There is no eccentricity. Questions? We're good. All right. All right. Now we're adding more bolts. And guess what we have here? In one side, we have 581 inch. This is one plate by seven inch. So this width here is seven inches. And the thickness gave you 581 inch. Material is different. It says A572. This gave you stronger material than the A36. And the other side, I have two plates. So now I'm going to have your double shear because my connection, if I may go back here, few slides, my connection is going to look like this. We have two plates on one side, one plate on the other side. So kind of sandwiching the other plate. Now, these two plates made out of A36. And this plate is 572. It's going to be a stronger plate. It was higher strength. We move forward here to the example. So one plate is going to be five eighths of an inch, seven inch. The other one is going to be two, two plates. The plate is half an inch by seven inches, and it's going to be 836. And I have four bolts. A, now it's going to be seven eighths of an inch bolt. It says here, high trends bolts A325X. So as you see here, some information can be given in the problem itself, in the text and some information can just figure it out based on the sketch provided to you, the detail. It's okay. So I have the same, I'm gonna have here three items that I need to figure out. The tensor strength for both of these two plates, tensor strength for the one plate, the 572, the higher trends, and tensor and shear strength for the 781 inch, but it's gonna be here double shear. So I'm gonna have here four bolts and also double shear. 
Okay. Here is the first play. A72 to 572. 5.8 times 7 inches. Go to material properties. F sub y is going to be equal to 50 ksi and F sub u is 65 ksi. Just want to be sure you guys know how to find out F sub y and F sub u for this material. Am I correct? In your midterm, I'm just going to give designation and part of your, your solution and answer is to find out F sub y and F sub u from the appropriate table. Gross section area of the plate is going to be the thickness multiplied by the width. Here we go. The net, I need to subtract here two bolts. Why two bolts? Here's the section. When you cut the sections, it's going to be like this. They're going to be cutting through two bolts. The bolt size is 7 8. How about the hole size? I'm going to say hole size. You need to add 1 6 7 inch. So you can either go back to the table for the standard hole size, or you can just add 1 6 7 inch. So I'm going to have here 7 inches subtracting two hole diameters multiplied by the plate thickness of the 5 8 1 inch. Now I need to check the yielding and the rupture for this plate. 90%, this is going to be the fee factor, F sub Y, the 50, gross section area 4.375, and here we go, 196 caps. When it comes to the rupture, I use fee factor 0.75 times 65 times the net cross section area, 156. Now this value here controls. So for this plate, the single plate, the trends of it is 156. Now let's look at the two plates. Two plates means when it comes to gross section area, I need to consider a factor of two, like what you see here. It is A36, so we have the FY36 and F sub U58 KSI. Gross section area is give you two, and then I have one half times seven. Because if I go back here, I have two plates, half by seven inch, half by seven inch. Net cross section area. I'm going to be taking the same cross section area here. It's going to be the same equation. You see this one, two, half inch, seven. But when we come to the seven, I'm going to be subtracting two whole diameters. So it's going to be two, seven, eight plus one, six, seven inch. And then you have here a factor of two because you have two bolts. So this two because you have two plates, this two because you have two bolts. All right. Use the same two equations for the yielding and rupture. Now, which one controls? It's going to be also the rupture. So again, I have three items. One single plate, two plates, and then the four bolts. Now, let's look here at the four bolts. The strength of four bolts, I have A325X, seven eighths of an inch. Is this single shear or double shear? You say double shear. Okay, that's why I'm using this value here. Look at this, double shear. So it's going to be A325, double shear. It's going to be 61.3 times four bolts. I have 245. So the bolts are very strong in this case compared to the plates. So one of the plates, just the single plate is 156. The two plates on the other side, 222.5. The bolts is going to be 245. So what controls now my design for the connection strength is give you the single plate, the 156 caps, and this should be sufficient for the trends of the connection. I guess we should express something like this in our midterm, right? It is repeated. Uh, we have two different examples. We have one with single shear, the other one was double shear, right? And then I can have a plate, I can have an angle, I can have a channel, right? I can add here a channel instead of a plate or an angle. And a chain material can be different from the plate material in terms of F sub Y and F sub U. Okay, very good. Now, this is here what I called it, I said direct shear, right? Because you have the force here, you just apply it and it is all concentric. Look at this bolt here and the force. You should expect 
if this like 100 kips, let's say that if you apply here 100 kips, each one of these bolts is gonna see 25 kips. So the force is just distributed here equally in each one of these bolts because of symmetry. It's gonna be that simple. Problem is gonna happen when you have a group of bolts like this. So look at this plate, it's like a bracket, and then you have eight bolts. You start to apply some load right here. So I may show the bolt, the force was originally like here, right? Before it rotates. This rotation is kind of exaggerated. Nothing's gonna be rotating like this. Actually, it's gonna stay in place. And if any rotation is gonna happen, it's gonna be extremely small. So as you see here, in the past, what do you mean in the past? In this previous example, the force was right here in the middle. And the CG of bolts, you see this gonna be the CG of eight bolts, not the dashed one, the solid one. That was concentric loading and the load was distributed uniformly on all bolts. Now I'm gonna be shifting this out here. It's eccentricity of E. So the distance from this force, which is P sub U, to CG is gonna be equal to E, the amount of eccentricity. Now, when you apply it, if you imagine here that we're just exaggerating here the amount of rotation, you see here that each bolt is moving differently from the other bolt. They are not the same. In our case, when you put the force right here in the middle, our bolts would move the same. If this plate, let's say, is going to get um, longer, right? If you put tension, if you put some tension force on it, so all bolts can see the same displacement. When a bolt is gonna see the same displacement, it means the force is gonna be the same. Now, let me put this here. I'm gonna say, let me add some eccentricity. Now, which bolt is gonna be moving more than the other? I'm gonna say, well, this bolt is gonna be moving more, right? There's more rotation. If a rotation is gonna happen, understand that this rotation is going to be extremely small. You may not be able even to see it with your eyes, but if any rotation is going to happen, some bolts are going to be moving more than the other. In a case like this, you should expect that the bolt is going to be moving more, is going to be seeing more force. This is what makes sense. And the big question is, where is the angle, where is the center of rotation? Are they gonna be rotating about the center of bolts? Or about another, let's say, center bolt, which is sitting a little bit further away from the plate itself? Example, if I say, here is the plate. I'm gonna put the plate right here. And I have this eight bolts. The question is, if some rotation is going to happen, would it happen about this center? Or would it happen about some other point, which is going to be this center in reality? I'm going to say, most likely, it's not going to happen about the center box. It's going to happen about another point, which is it's going to be a little bit further away from the plate. But usually, we assume that rotation is going to happen about the CG of bolts just to make it simple. Because in order for you to start to find out the forces and the amount of rotation that you have in there and the amount of displacement for each bolt, you need first to find out location of the center rotation. So this location of center rotation, which is more realistic, is not easy to find. The question is, where is this center of rotation? Where does it happen? But if I assume center of rotation is gonna be right at the CG, now, my job is going to be much easier because you assume all rotation is going to be happening about this point. And this point is defined to you because you can find it by just having it to be right in the middle of all of these bolts. It's going to be right at the center of them. So again, we have two ways of doing it. We can have the center rotation to be at the center of the bolts, or we can have it shifted, which is more realistic. Just to make it simple, we're going to assume it happens right here. So, okay. So, what type of forces that we apply here? I'm going to say the type of forces, actually, 
I may take this force resolve into two components. One of them is gonna be a vertical force and the other one is gonna be moment. Give me a moment like that. So I'm gonna have moment and vertical force. And both of these two forces, I'm gonna call this gonna be to be vertical force. And this is a moment which I call it a rotational force. So this gonna be some moment, which is equal to P times E. And this gave me the vertical force, which is just P. And as you see here, I put this moment about the CG of bolts, which means I'm assuming that the center rotation is gonna be the CG of bolts. So now I have two forces instead of just one force. The vertical force here is getting distributed evenly in all bolts, meaning, the first bolt here, as you can see a force equals to how much? Can someone help me here? P divided by how much? Eight, is it eight? Because I have eight bolts, right? And say so yes. So each one of these bolts is gonna see P over eight. Because this rotational force, you can connect from the center of each bolt, the center of the bolt group, which is the CG. So you're gonna connect here with the line and your developed force at this bolt is gonna be coming like this perpendicular to this line. So if you connect from here to there with a diagonal, you're gonna receive some bolt is gonna be coming here. Same thing in here, look at this. If you connect this, it's gonna be with one line, you're gonna see here a force coming like this and the force is gonna be perpendicular to this diagonal, right? It's gonna be like this. Same thing in here. So your force is gonna be coming like this, right? You can repeat this for all bolts. So let's say that I'm gonna be doing for this bolt, right? Where's the force now? The force is gonna be going like this. So I'm gonna have here eight vertical forces and eight rotational forces. So all of these bolts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is gonna be exposed to so some forces gonna be perpendicular to this diagonal line from the center of the bolts to each bolt. It's gonna be perpendicular to it like this. This is great. How much is this force? Is there a method to find out this force? You can say yes. We need to have a little bit of an equation. We need to find out the polar moment of inertia for these bolts which is summation of, let's say, the stiffness of each bolt times d squared. Did you guys see this before? This analysis to find out the forces of each bolt or no? This is your first time. Yes? Yeah, we went over it, but really, really briefly. In which course? Steel design. Steel design, okay. So there is a quick equation that you should be able to use. And this equation, um, we usually use it if you like to find out the forces on a set of piles. This is a foundation design, we use the same equation. Uh, because we assume that the foundation is so rigid and distribution is gonna be based on um, the stiffness of each one of these uh, bolts or piles. Same thing, we can use it in a connection like this. So with that, I'm gonna say, you're gonna call this, let's say, bolt one, bolt two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this gave you, let's say, F1 on the first one. Now, you should be able to determine that this F1, which is a force on this bolt due to rotation, is gonna be the same as this force here, correct? Let's say, yeah, it's gonna be the same value. This value is gonna be the same as this value. And this value here, this force, is gonna be the same as this force here. So I'm gonna have two values for all the forces. One is gonna be for the bolt like this, meaning bolt one, and let's say it's gonna be eight, bolt four and bolt five would have the same value of force. Just direction is gonna be different. 
Why? Because the force direction here is gave you like this, and the pull force here is gave you like this. So this is gonna be four equal forces, and the inner ones you're gonna have also four equal forces. So okay, good. So what is the final force that goes to each one of these bolts? Let's say this outer bolt is going to see the highest force. Not just this bolt, it's going to be four outer bolts, right? It's going to see the highest force. Why? Because this F1 is going to be higher than this F2. If I may put this here, I'm going to see this going to be F2. The final force that goes to this bolt is going to be square root of P over H squared plus F1 squared, which means I need to find here the resultant of both of these two forces. So if you want to find out the force that goes to each one of these bolts, you should be able to. And you need to understand that the forces give you like the highest forces on any of these bolts is going to be at these corners. The one which is really further away from the central bolts. Now, this is when it comes to the actual force applied to the bolt itself. So the question is, how about the strength? The strength of the bolt. I guess say the bolt strength is gonna be the same. Any one of these bolts would have the same strength as long as it's gonna be same single shear, same material, same diameter. I'm expecting the strength of each single bolt is gonna be the same. All right. So I'd like to throw here some numbers just for sake of discussion. You can say the bolt strength. If I may say this this way, you can say bolt of trends, PRN for the bolt, let's say 20 kips. All right. The resultant force on the first bolt here, you can say on this bolt, the resultant force, which means P sub U, final P sub U. I'm going to call it here F sub U is equal to demand, let's say exactly also 20 kips. Resultant force on the second bolt, just gonna throw a number there, I'm gonna say F U on this bolt is 18 kips. So this here is gonna be 20, this is 18, 18, 20, 20, 18, 18, 20. Okay, so what is the strength of each single bolt? I'm gonna say 20 kips. It's great. But when you look here at the force distribution, you see some bolts is really hit hard, which means like this corner bolts, but the inner bolts are not really hit hard. Now the question is, what is the strength of each one of these bolts? Now it's gonna be tricky because you're gonna say the bolt strength itself is gonna be 20 kips, but as a group, it is not 80 kips. Because it is true that you loaded one of the bolts to 20 kips, just one of them at the corner, but the inner ones, the other bolts, are not really loaded to 20 kips. Meaning the corner bolts or the bolt with higher force demand is gonna be controlling your design. And you cannot really load all the bolts to get to their maximum strength, which is 20 kips per bolt. So let's say, if I'd like to come here and say, both strengths is gonna be equal to 20 kips, right? How about the group strength? Can I say it's gonna be equal to 20 times eight? It's gonna be 160, I'm gonna say no. This is not true. It's gonna be slightly less. Meaning the group action is gonna be reducing the group bolt strength. Okay. Let's see here a table given to us in your steel manual. It's going to help you to find out the strength of a group of bolts. I would say if the bolt is going to be seeing, let's say, 10 caps and they have five bolts and you have direct shear, capacity is going to be 50 caps. Right? This is very similar to the two examples we started with. 
plate one angle, two bolts. Two placed one plate with four bolts. Well, what we have done, we have just taken here the single shear or double shear multiplied by number of bolts, and we're done. This is what you call here direct shear. Now we have something interesting. So here's the picture that I'd like to look at. This is this table. I'm going to be concentrating on the top of it. So you say, okay, let me move here. Here is one row of bolts. And not necessarily to be exactly fine because it says here number of bolts in one vertical row. And in this table, you can have two bolts only or three all the way to 12 bolts. So, okay, good. The spacing needs to be the same, similar. And the spacing here, I have two options, either three inches or four inches. So I'm gonna go there. Excuse me, three or six inches. So you have three inch and six inch spacing. So the spacing between bolts. Okay, I'm looking at the three inches spacing. So the spacing here is the same. The eccentricity in this case, I call it E or EX. So, okay. Now let me look at all of this information. It says here, this table is going to give you this coefficient C. I'm trying to understand what is a C used for. For eccentrically loaded bolt group at an angle of zero. What do you mean by angle of zero? It means I don't have a case like this. So this angle is equal to zero, like this, vertical, exactly vertical, load, right? It says here, PRN is going to be equal to the following. The fee factor is 0.75, okay? R sub N is going to be equal to this C multiplied by R sub N lowercase. So what is this R sub N uppercase? It's going to be for a group of bolts. So this gave me the trends. PRN, the group, strength of a set of bolts. Just R sub N lowercase is going to be for one bolt. And look at it, it's written right here. Normal trends per bolt. Normal trends per bolt is not going to be mentioned here. I don't have it here. So where do you see it? I'm going to say, you see it. If I may go back here to some slides, it's going to be coming from here. Shear, strength of bolts. This is where you get R sub N lower case. So the value that you have in this table 7, 1, actually, this is all is going to be R sub N is going to be R lower case sub N, which means this value here. So this is going to be from the table. So I'm going to say R sub N normally transfer bolt, right? I'm going to say from tables, table 7 dash 1. And this CC, it looks like to me, is like the effective number of bolts in the group. So I'm gonna say this C to understand it because it's not written this way, but this is my understanding is gonna be effective number of bolts in the group. So the group, for example, if it has six bolts, look at the numbers below six, then you have a couple of bolts. It means instead of having six bolts, you're gonna have 5.45. They're not really six bolts. They're gonna act as if they are 5.45. So this gives you the C factor. So what you're reading here is gonna be the C factor. So let's say that I have 10 bolts and each bolt has a strength of 10 kips. Just throwing here a number, right? And EX, the eccentricity, let's say six inches. So I guess, okay, six inches is right here, six inches, right? And they have 10 bolts. It means effective number of bolts is gonna be 7.79. So I guess say in a case like this, F, VRN, lower case, equals, Ten caps. V R sub n uppercase for the group is going to be equal to seven point seven nine times ten is going to be equal to seventy seven point nine caps. So I have here some reduction. And instead of having hundred caps, because I would imagine that usually if I have direct shear, if you like here to compare between the direct shear and eccentric shear, 
if you have direct shear, you would end up with 10 times 10, it's gonna be 100 kips. But in this case here, when you have 10 bolts and you have some centricity of six inches and the spacing is gonna be three inches between each bolt and the other, right? You have one row. Your capacity is gonna be equal to 79, 77.9 kips. So have you a drop? Let's say about 25% drop in the strength of the bolts because of the eccentricity. Because the effect of this type of forces, see this type of forces, rotational forces like this. And because not all bolts is gonna be all loaded to the factor or to the load, the VRN load, right? Some of them is gonna be loaded. So in a case like this, I'm gonna say, for each one of these bolts, I'm gonna pick here the top one. It's gonna be equal to PU divided by N. And then I'm gonna have another component that's gonna be running like this. And it's gonna be horizontal force. Why? Because if you go here to the center of the group and start connecting with some lines, this is going to be perpendicular to it. The force here is going to be slightly lower. And the force here, if I have five, is going to be exactly equal to zero. Next force is going to be coming like this. And next force is going to be coming like that. And usually you should be able to find out this in your relationship if you connect it with a line like this. is gonna be something like that. So the force value is gonna be kind of, if you like to do this um, type of uh, analysis, right? So you can say the force here at the top and bottom bolts is gonna be the same. And then at the end, your resultant is gonna be based on the vertical component and horizontal component. And this is gonna be the bolt that controls your design. So effective number of bolts in a case like this, as we have done, is going to be reduced. And look at all of these numbers. You start here as two bolts. Let's say if you have two bolts, the space is going to be, let's say, EX is going to be two inches. Effective number of bolts is going to be 1.18. You don't really have two bolts. If you open your steam manual, you don't have only this case, just one row. You have also cases when you have two rows. And you have also cases when this force here is going to be on an angle. And you can play with the angles. You can say, for example, 30 degrees, 6 degrees, 45 degrees. And then you can work with it and find that effective number of bolts. Very useful tool. And, um, and certainly you are going to be using it very soon. Any questions? Yes? No? We're good? All right. Just an idea here. Um, that if you look here at all of these bolts, it's gonna be all loaded in shear. But when you look at a case like this, all of these bolts is gonna be loaded in tension and compression. So let's say at a certain point, let's say maybe the bottom two bolts gonna be exposed to compression. And you know that bolts, when they are exposed to compression, they don't really see any force, correct? Because this T shape or this T break is gonna be bearing on the column flange. So if you think about each one of these bolts is gonna be exposed to vertical shear, yeah? And the vertical shear is gonna be the same. And also they're gonna be exposed to some tension force. Tension force, tension force. And here, nothing is gonna be on the shear. Now, each one of these bolts is gonna be exposed to vertical shear and tension force. And there should be this combined um, the strength when you have this tension and shear at the same time on each one of these bolts. As you see here, Here's uh, the group of bolts is gonna be in tension and this is gonna be like in the compression and this is gonna be your neutral axis. And then you can run the analysis very similar to that. So each one of these bolts, some of them is gonna be exposed to tension, like the top 10 bolts, the bottom two, you don't see really any tension or any compression. And each one of these bolts is gonna be exposed to the same shear because shear is gonna be coming from this vertical component when you move it here. Is give you the total force plus some moment acting wire. Um, here's the methodology. I'm not gonna go in detail through it. I just put it there for your knowledge, but we're not gonna even cover it in come when it comes to examples. But it's good when you have it, just keep it in hand. Uh, one example here on this eccentric connection, and it has this bolt group, 
as it's shown here in figure five seven, exposed to a vertical load, the bolt group capacity is nearly. Um, it says here that I have five bolts, one and one eighth of an inch, A490N. So I have the bolt designation and I have the size. Amount of eccentricity is gonna be four inches. The spacing is three inches. So I'd like to see here the trends for these bolts. Um, I'm going to be looking here at one and one eighth of an inch, group B, because it's going to be 490. If you look at this, it says here 490 N. Here is 490, which is group B N. This is going to be single shear. One and one eighth of an inch is going to be 50.7. So each bolt is going to be seen here 50.7 as a capacity. Okay, how many bolts do I have? I said I have five bolts. Can I just take five multiply by 50.7? I'm gonna say no, because effective number of bolts is gonna be less than five. You say okay, let's see number of bolts. Can we go to the table? I have five bolts. Okay, here's five bolts in a row. Three inch for the spacing. I understand that, and four inches for EX. So here's EX, four inches. Effective number of bolts is going to be 3.4. As if you have only 3.4, you don't really have five bolts. So we're going to be taking here 3.4 times the strength for one bolt is going to get you here 172 kips. And this gave you the trends for the vertical force here that you can use as a capacity for this group of bolts. Very good. Questions? All right. Just gonna skip this for now. This is gonna be uh, critical when it comes to seismic. We're not gonna be covering seismic at this point. Now, think about any beam connection. And I'd like to show you here some of the failures, like the failure modes. This failure here, when it comes to the bolt itself, is given by bearing. As you see here, you're going to have bearing on the bolt and bearing on the plate, and failure is going to happen in bearing. So we call this bearing failure. This prime failure here is going to happen, let's say, when you have a T section like this, you start to apply tension, and the section itself is going to get some deformation. So you see here, when the section is getting some deformation, actually, you are bending the bolt. And all the stresses is gonna be just concentrated at the end of this T section, or let's say even W section. You don't want this bolt to be exposed to any moment because this moment is gonna be adding additional stresses to the load applied to the bolt. You don't want this to happen. And your only way, if you like to do stiffening to this connection is to add some stiffener plates like this. If you imagine that you'd be adding two stiffener plates, one on each side, you're gonna be reducing the amount of bending or even preventing it. You're gonna be eliminating any movement on the bottom flange of the T or the W section, and this is gonna stay straight. So actually the, this bolt here is not gonna be bending this way. It will never bend this way. Also in certain connections, you may have this block shear failure. And what's the block shear? I talked about very quickly last time. I said, if you look at this section here and the expected mode of failure, and let's say this gonna be the expected mode of failure, right? You have two sides here of the plate is gonna be exposed to shear and the failure here is gonna be in shear. And this section of it is gonna be exposed to tension. So you have here combined shear and tension failure in the connection. And you are gonna be going through this maybe next time. This is what you call here block shear. There is a certain equation for it, for the block shear that I'd like to cover with you guys. But this is also one of the modes of failure. Now let's talk about welding. We're done here with bolts. This is enough about bolts. Now we're gonna be talking about welding and the type of welding. Um, we're gonna be covering uh, gravity connections. 
we're not going to be doing here seismic connections at this time. And we need to understand different type of welds. How does it look like? What, what, what do we call it? And how would you call it in a detail and the trends of it? The document that we are using here, which is also referenced by the ACE and also referenced by the AIC, is going to be this AWS D1.1 for structure steel. It's called here Structure Welding Code OST. Okay, great. I have another document, which is this supplemental document. It is going to be for seismic. It is AWS D1.8. So 1.1 is going to be for general structure steel connections, like in gravity, and 1.8 is going to be for the seismic. This is this includes here some concern and stuff that you need to be aware of once it comes to seismic welding and seismic connections. Um, the welding process, um, I don't want to go through it in details, but I give you here enough information so that you can look at it, but you need to understand what is this pre-qualified welding connection. When you go to the AWS, and also when you go to the IC book, Um, I've just seen the chat here, and I have a question on the bolts. Um, the question is, um, do you use the lowercase or the small f sub r before you multiply by c? You can see here, it doesn't matter. If I may stop here for a second, go back to answer this question. And please, guys, feel free just to speak. Uh, it's okay. Just use a microphone if you like. So about this equation here. Do I need to find out first R sub N, the multiply by C, and then after that by phi, or I can do just take the C multiply by phi R N lowercase. Let's say, let's look here back in this table. This table gives you here phi R sub N lowercase. So you can say, if this is give you here PRN, right? Of course, it's going to be this table multiplied by phi, right? How about that? Just to be politically correct. This PRN is what you see here in the table, right? So the table is going to give you here PRN lowercase. Whether you multiply the phi factor the front or you wait to the end and then multiply by the c factor you're going to end up with the same result this table give you here phi r n directly so the thing is if you like to find out r sub n you need to take the phi r n from the table divide by 0.75 and then multiply by c factor and then again multiply by the phi factor again by the 0.75 so it doesn't matter I just take the PRN from the table, multiply by the C factor, and call the day. Am I clear on this? Any question? Or we're good? Yes? Okay. Okay. Talking about the welding. And what's the pre-qualified welded connections? You don't want to start from scratch. You don't want to reinvent the bike or the wheel. So what happens is they have all this pre-qualified connections. They are all documented in the steel manual in the AWS. And usually nothing is going to go out of this pre-qualified connections. So in this pre-qualified connections, you can just use them safely and it's give you okay, you can use them. Yeah, plenty of them. And any welded connection that you may see here is gonna be, of course, pre-qualified connection. If you don't have pre-qualified connection, you cannot just use it according to the code. Code says you need to build. If you have, let's say, if you are trying to invent here a new connection, never been used before. So you need to do it and test it and then say now is going to be qualified connection based on testing. In our case here, we're going to be using only qualified or pre-qualified connection. This is what they call here code approved. Um, for the welding, we have here a few videos. 
And if you like, you can take some time and watch them. You have an access to this. It's gonna be about the welding, the process, and how does it work, and the arc welding, and which is very interesting to understand the welding process. I maybe care more about the analysis for the welded connection. For the electrode itself, it says E70 and 70 is going to be in case side the tensile strength of the welding material. So usually, the ultimate strength of the steel is going to be, let's say, 65 KSI. For the grade 50 steel, here we have 70 KSI. So use the weld, generally speaking, the welding material is stronger than the steel itself. In all cases, this welding material is going to be stronger than the steel material itself of the steel section. But this welding material is usually brittle. Our steel material, let's say for W sections, for angles, for anything, is going to be more ductile. We have the yield point, we have the yield plateau. Here you don't. It's going to be very brittle. So through is going to be stronger, but it's going to be brittle. This is why we don't want this in the seismic connection to dissipate energy. We'd like dissipation of the energy to happen in the structure steel member itself, not in the welding material. We don't want this to happen. So as it says here, the material itself for the weld is going to be 70 KSI. Now, I'll just skip this for now. I'm going to say the joint configuration. Most of the connection that you're going to see is going to be like one of this lab or this team. Most of them. This is going to be very famous. Corner is going to be OK, but in corner, in this case, where would you put the material, the filling material, or the welding material? So let's say, how would I weld this lab connection here? I have two plates sitting on top of each other. I'd like to weld them. So my only chance to weld them, I'm going to be doing welding here, right? And where else? On the bottom, between the two. We're going to call this fillet weld, right? How about in this T connection? In this T connection, this plate is going to be exposed to tension force or shear force coming this way, right? So it's going to be tension or shear. So I'm going to be doing the welding here on this side and the welding here on the other side. It's going to be also fill it well. You say, how about this connection here? This plate is going to be either exposed to tension and it's going to be in this direction or maybe shear in that direction, right? Now, where can I provide the weld? I'm going to put the weld right here. So, okay, how about in a case like this? Let's say that you have a steel tube. Two steel tubes next to each other. Where would you put the weld? The weld is going to be provided right here along the length of the interface between the two round sections. So, okay, good. How about here? You say, oh, this is not easy. I cannot just provide the weld on the top. So I need to cut a piece of this. I'm gonna cut a piece of this steel. I'm gonna do this groove well. It's gonna be one way, right? You cut this piece. And then what do you do? You fill it with welding material. But someone here decides to do this butt weld. What is a butt weld? You just take this, you make it vertical. You put them spaced away from each other, let's say by quarter of an inch or three eighths of an inch, and then you start to fill it with welding material. So the welding material is going to be right in the middle. We call this butt weld. So you can have groove weld or butt weld in a connection like that. You can say, how about in this corner connection? Here, I provided welding from both sides. Here's going to be from both sides. How about here? It's going to be only from one side. I'm going to say, well, you can do also wedge welding. You can come here to a piece, and then you can just cut a piece of it, and we call this partial penetration weld. You see this piece here? You're going to remove it and do the welding. If you like to have full penetrating weld, you're going to be cutting the entire thing here, and then do the full pin weld. So you can have partial pin weld, or you can have full pin weld. Same thing here. You can have butt weld, or you can have full pin weld, if you cut it this way. Okay. And this explains what happened in this V notch, why it is needed. Here is a groove well, the fillet well, right? 
We call this plug weld. You're gonna be drilling two holes in the top of the plate and fill it with weld between the two plates. You can do slot weld. You do like a notch or a slot, and then you start weld from the top. You weld the two plates to each other. This is here considered to be full pin weld. It's not really butt weld. Butt weld, when you have the materials gonna be fully between the two plates, as if you cut the two plates like this, like this, and then you fill it completely with the weld material. What I really care about when it comes to this fillet weld is give you the thickness of the weld. Now, where is the thickness of the weld? Thickness of the weld is give you the leg length. But the effective is give you actually this length, which is this throat. You see the distance, which is the throat. I'm going to put this length. This give you the real critical one. This give you resisting the shear. So when you call the weld thickness, when you ask for the weld, you say, for example, quarter of an inch, this give you the quarter of an inch from here to there. And this also is going to be quarter of an inch. They're going to be equal to each other. But the effective thickness of the weld is going to be equal to the throat length. And as you see here, the throat length is actually smaller than the weld thickness. So if you want to find out the relationship between the throat to the leg, so I'm going to say here the throat, for effective weld thickness. This is going to be equal to. Now this is going to be here 45 degrees. So I'm expecting this is going to be equal to square root of two times the weld thickness, which is the leg. So it's going to be 0 0.707. Then it's going to be weld thickness. So it's going to be slightly smaller, small. And this is going to be the throat is also, is also called the effective weld thickness. It's okay. You have different type of configurations here. How would you provide the weld? You can have, and this is gonna be complete penetration weld, right? And you're gonna have groove weld from both sides, or you can have butt weld, or you can have this give you partial pin weld. This here called P partial pin weld, right? This also is gonna be partial pin weld. This is here is gonna be square so that you can provide butt weld. Here's gonna be pebble, and with the pebble, you can do the groove well and so forth. If you like to do welding like this, if you like to do here full pin weld, you need to have some backing material. You need to put a kind of a steel plate here at the bottom so that the welding material is gonna be dropping off. And then this backing material, you need to remove it at the end of the welding process. So after you're done with the welding process, you start to grind the welding, and then they need to knock this off. You don't leave it in. Leaving it in is gonna be a problem when it comes to the ductility of moon trains and seismic windows. It's gonna be okay if you wanna leave it for gravity members, but just to do a clean job, you need to remove this packing plate. And as it says here, this considers to be means and methods. This is gonna be for a moment frame and look what happened. In the moment frame, the connection between the web for the shear and the beam itself is going to be with the shear plate and some bolts. This shear plate is actually welded to the flange of the beam, of the cone, and then it comes bolted to the beam web. The top and bottom flange needs to be completely welded, so it's going to be full pin welded to the column flanges. So when you have a moment frame like this, you should expect that the tension force is going to be, let's say, here, compression force is going to be here, right? During seismic event. And the entire force needs to be transferred to this stiffener. And the stiffener is going to be right here. Entire force here needs to be transferred through this. And actually, the design force here is going to be based on plus the sizing of the beam itself. So it's going to be coming to the point, it's going to be F the force F sub Y multiplied by the cross section area of the plate. And you need to transfer it through the connection here. This why you need to do here this full pin weld. To do this full pin weld, now the welding, you need to cut it on an angle like this, it's gonna be beveled, and then you need to put backing material. And the backing plate, you're gonna put it there for the entire width of the beam. And then after you're done, you're gonna be grinding the, the welding material, and then you're gonna be knocking off this backing. You don't leave it there because this actually is going to be 
causing brittleness of the entire system and reduced ductility of the mom frame. Still to be removed at the end of the day. This is just examples here of the partial pin weld. So you can have it on an angle of six degrees, 45 degrees. You cannot have it on 30 degrees. Why is that? Because it is going to be a non pre qualified welded connection. This is all what you see here in the qualified connections. The pre qualified connection in the code, you're going to see this on an angle of six degrees or 45 degrees. Right? But once you go here to a different angle, you cannot really use in the in the design because it's gonna be non-pre-qualified. I guess now you understand the meaning of this pre-qualified and why you cannot use it or why you can use it. I'd like to get to the analysis because we are running out of time. Um, let me get to this. Strength of the well and shear, how this is done. We have two types of electrodes, which is the welding materials. We have the EXX 70 and we have the 80. The 70 is what is available. 80 is not really available unless you're using different type of materials or special alloy and you need really high strength welding material. So in this case, you may need to go to 80 KSI, but in most cases, the 70 is what's available. And if you did not mention it, they're gonna be using 70 KSI. The thickness of the weld is gonna be this dimension, the horizontal dimension, which is the same as this vertical dimension because this here is gonna be at 45 degrees. Effective weld thickness, which is the throat, is gonna be equals to 0.707 TW, which is the weld thickness. So the wood thickness that you call on the plan or in details is going to be this dimension, not the throat thickness. And where is this 0.707 coming from? It's going to be square root of two. Divide by two, am I correct? Or just square root of two? Is it one half or just square root of two? Yeah, the angle is 45 degrees, absolutely. So this gave be square root of two divided by two. It's gonna be one half over there. Because square root of two is 1.414. So this is actually one half of it. So if this is gonna be one, this dimension is gonna be 1.414, and this dimension is gonna be equals to 0.707. See, great. How about the strength? If you remember for any material here, the strength and shear is gonna be equal to 60% of the strength, if you remember that. So I'm gonna be taking it for the shear is gonna be 0.6 times F sub Y. Okay, 0.6 times F sub Y is gonna be for shear. The effective is the thickness that I'd like to use in my analysis. Not the thickness, not the cold thickness. And T effective is equal to 0 0.707 times TW. So understand where is this coming from. This one is a T effective. This one's gonna be F sub Y. Here's a 0 0.6 and the T factor is 0 0.75. I can clean the numbers a little bit. It's gonna be equal to 22.27 times the weld thickness as in kip per inch. So this equation here or this number includes the 0 0.707, which means this is here made for the effective weld thickness. Can this give you equal again 22.27 times the thickness of the welded connection? Now let's do it for each one sixteen of an inch. What is this one sixteen of an inch? I'm gonna say if I do it like this, if I take this 22.27 divided by 16, it means the strength of the welded connection is gonna be equal to 1.39 kip per inch in the longitudinal direction of the welded connection. You can see if this gonna be in the length. 
per one significant inch of the well thickness itself. Okay. Meaning, if I give you here a welded connection, right? I'm gonna say the length of the weld equals 10 inch. The weld thickness, quarter of an inch. What is the strength of the welded connection? VRN. So I'm gonna say VRN for the weld equals. I'm gonna say it is equal to 1.39 times. This is here per inch of the width length. You can say times 10 times. This here is going to be for one to even inch of width. Now I have a quarter. How many one to even inch you have in a quarter? You have four. How much is this now? You can be saying, how much is this? Can someone run the analysis please real quick? 40 times 1.39. Yes. I got the same answer, 55.6 kips. So actually doing the weld analysis is simple. It's not really hard. So I'm gonna be saying, is this in shear or in tension? And which one do you think is gonna be stronger? Is it the shear strength or the tensile strength? Shear strength. Shear strength is gonna be weaker, right? Look at the equation here. Once you have any shear, it says 0.6. So generally speaking, I should expect the shear is gonna be weaker. So you're gonna say, okay, how about the connection like this? If I'm going to go here to another detail that we have looked at. It's going to be very important that you know where to use this and why it's going to be okay to use it every time. I'm going to be looking at this connection here, which is this one. If I have the force going up like this, it means this weld is going to be in tension, correct? Which side is going to be in tension? I'm going to say the side which is facing the horizontal plate. But the side of the weld which is going to be against the vertical plate is going to be exposed to shear. But if you have it 100% in shear, so this force is going to be coming this way to take this plate and move it this way, you're going to say, oh, both sides going to be in shear. I understand. But if you do vertical force, this side of the plate, right, the weld here which is touching this side of the plate is going to be in tension. And the welding, which is going to be touching this side of the plate, is going to be in shear. Since shear is going to be there anyways, and for all connections, what I need to do is just use this shear equation, the 1.39 kip per inch per 167 inch. So what I'm saying is, use this equation safely whenever you have tension or shear. Because it's true that one side is going to be tension, one side is going to be shear, or both ones going to be in shear. So this equation is going to be controlling your design. So I'm going to stay with this equation here. I'm not going to change it when it comes to tension. So the equation, as it says here in the steel manual, it says VRN is going to be equal to 1.39. If you want to use two, this is fine. I just say 1.39 times D times L. And what is L? It's going to be the length of the weld. What is D? It's going to be the number of the seven inch in the weld thickness. Is it in the effective in the root? I'm going to say no, in the leg. Not on the throat, not the effective. It's going to be the actual weld thickness. What is the actual weld thickness? Actual weld thickness is going to be this dimension here. So when you call the weld to be quarter of an inch, this gave you the dimensions to be quarter of an inch, not this dimension here. No one's gonna be able to measure this dimension, but you can put a caliber, or maybe you can put a tape and figure out this dimension, which is from here to there, like this. And say, well, I can measure this, 
right? But I can measure, I cannot measure the effective. So I'd like to use this. When I call it on the plan, I'm gonna use it this dimension here. Uh, any questions? No, yes? Okay, so next time we're gonna be finishing the welding connection and we have some examples and then we're gonna do the review for your meter. All right, good night.